little could be more timely than our topic today, equity through innovative asset management. Uh, I'm Jim Dieter, CEO of the Asset Leadership Network. Uh, the ALN is a not-for-profit trade association dedicated to sharing best practices for asset management and asset leadership. And for more information, of course, you can visit our website at assetleadership.net. Uh, and we want to thank our organizational members of the ALN uh, and our patrons, ABS Quality Evaluations, uh, and Onuma Systems are our patron organizations, and you see our organizational members there. Uh, so thanks very much to them because they make all of this possible. So thanks. We especially want to thank our organizational member, Grant Thornton, for co-hosting this program and providing such meaningful content for our audience. Uh, it's really an example of the way the ALN is designed to work, looking for win-win-wins with our organizational member, uh, organizational members and our overall ALN mission, as we've said, uh, and with, with you, the audience for these various events, how we can help you. So it may seem unlikely that uh, the asset management can address such big problems as equity. That's been an issue in our country since it started. Uh, but I think you're going to see today that there are viable, repeatable ways that it, in fact, uh, can make a big difference. Uh, I think it's, it's a great opportunity. So we are very honored today, and I am personally honored to be able to introduce former Governor of Maryland, Martin O'Malley, uh, who is now with Grant Thornton. Uh, he'll be drawing on his successful uh, and repeatable ways he addressed equity as governor of Maryland and is also, of course, as before that is mayor of Baltimore. Uh, so the panelists, the other panelists today are Grant Thornton's Tim Luzano. Welcome, Tim. Uh, we'll be demonstrating a way to use technology uh, to assess transit inequities in metropolitan areas and create visuals from public data to see possible solutions. Uh, a highly, highly interesting topic that I'm very, very eager to see myself. And we also have one of my favorite people and the uh, current uh, superstar of the ALN, Cecilia Moat, who is president of Strategies Insight. Cecilia is a lawyer. Uh, she has earned her a ALN A55K professional certification, which means she is competent in the ISO 55,000 structure and her company, Strategies Insight, is an ALN member. Uh, she is also, very relevantly, co-chair of the ALN Addressing Equity with Asset Leadership Committee. That's uh, been very important to our activities over the last year and will be very much going forward. Uh, that committee has published a position paper that is innovative in saying that involving all stakeholders, a key part of ISO 55000, in strategic planning is a powerful first step in making public or private assets more equitable. So with that, I will turn it over to Cecilia. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. It is a pleasure to be here and a privilege as well, um, especially on today as we're having the anniversary of our collective national tragedy um, and trauma that we, it wasn't a national tragedy, it was a trauma that we all endured May 25th of 2020 to go along with all the other traumas we've been doing, dealing with with COVID. But there's an analogy to be drawn between the George Floyd situation and the issues that were raised by it for the police of this country. And that is the analogy of the asset of reputation and brand and looking at what one does with one's main asset, the brand and your reputation. And I know that our people in blue earn a great reputation on many fronts. And then there are things that will come along and tarnish. And so our concept here in looking at equity as a part of 
the ISO 55000 structure was one to say, there's got to be a way that we always look at th making things better. And Jim Dieter was very, has always looked at the issue of diversity and inclusion from my understanding, from all that I've learned over the years of hearing about what ALN's work was and his drive and passion to make sure, are we having enough diversity in terms of who we're including and what we're doing. And when he decided to do for the Restructuring America um, series that we had back in December of 2020, when I was invited to come join a panel on equity to start exploring how does ISO 55000 play into dealing with issues of equity and underserved communities and making a difference in issues like racial strife, issues like not um, un underserved communities and rural communities. It's not just race. Diversity is a wide breadth of issues, whether you're talking inner city, you're talking Appalachia, these are wide issues. And the fact that ISO 55000 is used internationally as an international standard made it something that we thought, wait a minute, after we did that panel, that was such an insightful panel, maybe we ought to be exploring more, finding a way to do an overlay, an equity overlay to ISO 55000. And so what we thought was equity as an issue is a tough one. Diversity, inclusion, all of that is a tough one but it's a structural problem as we often say, instead of having shame and blame games, we look at the fact that we have systemic racism, we have systemic shortfalls in service and systemic shortfalls in who we address and how we address underrepresented communities. And so what is needed for a structural problem is a structural solution. And one of our committee members, we for, Jim said, let's form a task force for equity and looking at how using ISO 55000 can make a difference. And we have various task force members who have come from different um, walks of life. But Hugh Sinclair always loved to say, structural si situations require structural solutions. ISO 55000 is a structural solution in that it provides for the inclusion of stakeholders. Um, it has many, many requirements and shall statements. But after the very first one that they focus you on, which is understanding and aligning the mission of an organization with its asset management, and let's make sure we all understand an asset is anything that brings value to an organization in achieving its mission. After that, number one, Number two, the second thing that they focus in on is involve all relevant stakeholders. Everybody always thinks that's an easy to do, but guess what? Do you always involve all relevant stakeholders? How do you define relevant? I know that for us, oftentimes we go to the usual suspects. My thought is you need to go to the unusual suspects and look at relevance a little bit differently. ISO 55004.2 tells you, you must involve all relevant stakeholders. We then turn as much, many of the ISO statements will always, standards will always relate to other ISO standards. We turn to ISO 26000, to give us a little bit more clarity on who relevant is and how to look at that. I like to say it's anybody that is going to be impacted by your mission. That means those who work for you to achieve the mission, those who supply you whatever you need to accomplish the mission, those who fund you, the government and communities in with which you sit and offer your services or your project, as well as ancillary people who might just pass through and 
happen to get impacted. So you've got the legal liabilities, we won't go to that, but we're going to look at everything and take a broader holistic approach at looking at it. So when we think about this, we try to come up with a template to give organizations so that they could tackle creating their own. And that would be create a mission statement that says we are going to be intentional about looking at the stakeholders and about expanding our view on who are stakeholders. We are then going to look at making sure our vision is clear and everyone knows that it's inclusive and then you'll have a strategy. So one of the things that we had in our paper, we created a white paper, which we actually submitted to the Biden administration last December before the inauguration to, in hopes that they would begin thinking about it. And boy, were we thrilled when on January 20th, President Biden came out with all of those executive orders and especially executive order 1385 for advancing racial equity and moving forward. We think that this portends an opportunity for us to make a difference by giving a framework that is very non-triggering. This is the key. <laughs> we, when we talk about the issue of diversity or the distribution of resources or anything of that nature, it becomes something that can be very testy, who's getting what. And if we take it down to a level that is basic, and ISO 55000 does that, it creates that framework that is basic, a common lexicon that everybody can use that is non-triggering, non-blame shame. What it does then is allow you to boil down to what is the organization's mission what is my role in achieving that? And what are the roles of others around me in achieving that? Who are we going to impact? How do we not impact them negatively, but optimize the impact that we provide? So these are the types of things, and we'll get into it more, but I want to hand over the floor to our keynote speaker, Governor Martin, O'Malley, former Governor Martin O'Malley, who was also former mayor of Baltimore. Um, and I don't know if he will remember me, but I remember him very vividly at, uh -huh. a, a, aha, I won't tell stories, but I will tell a few. Back in either 1998 or 1999, when International Development Resource Council, Research Council was in Baltimore, you greeted us and you were there and you were somebody who had such a passion for life, aside from your passion for guitar, which you showed, and your passion for dancing, which I got to do with you, but you won't remember. <laughs> you had a passion for making a difference, for smart government and making a difference. So when you ran for president, I was very excited to hear your thoughts. And I'm even more excited to be in the Zoom room with you, though not not in physical proximity, close enough to see you and hear your thoughts. So please, Governor O'Malley, would you share with us some of your thoughts and some of the work that you've been doing with Grant Thornton before we hear from Tim with his excellent program that he's got. Awesome, thank you. Ms. Mollett, thanks a lot. And thank you for uh, those uh, fond, fond reminiscences. Uh, 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 the, uh, I wrote a book, it's called, in fact, Smarter Government. It says a lot about where our democracy has been over the last four years that not another American owned the domain, Smarter Government, until I wrote this book. <laughs> so, um, oh. what, and uh, it was not the sort of book that you'll see on Oprah's book club. You know, I wrote it because I was very lucky uh, to have been tipped to some technological innovations that were big game changers in terms of leadership and management practice. This era of information sharing, of openness, of transparency, of performance measurement. Uh, let's be honest, for about 250 years at every level of our, our, our government, whether it was state or, or local, municipal, federal, uh, we tended to operate by way of 
annual budget inputs instead of daily action outcomes. Uh, so I, I saw what was happening in, in other cities, notably north of us in New York City in the 90s, even as Baltimore had a series of television series made about our seeming inability to get a hold of violent crime. I saw how the NYPD was using data and the map, you know, taking what they already knew about where crime had happened in the past and being able to show everyone in an open, transparent, collaborative way on a common platform. You talked about standards, right? A common lexicon. Look, this is where people, regardless of color, regardless of whether they voted for the mayor in the last election or not, uh, regardless of income, this is what we know about the dynamic that's happening out there. This is in terms of public safety. How can we get inside the turning radius of that trend that growing problem, whether it's daytime burglaries or, or shootings or what have you, so that we can, uh, we can change that map. <laughs> we can uh, save lives. Uh, so having witnessed this in person as a council person, uh, I came home and in Baltimore, a number of us on the council kept asking, why can't we be open and transparent? Why, instead of contenting ourselves with excuses, why can't we measure outcomes? And we ended up, I, I ran in 1999 for mayor, and uh, we ended up winning all six council districts in a majority African-American city. And um, we then set about to take that uh, approach of openness, transparency, performance measurement enterprise-wide. You mean with also trash? I mean with everything. You mean with trash and with potholes? I mean with everything. So every, in a two week rotation, Cecilia, every, we had 10 different departments that every two weeks came into the city stat room collaboratively. My command staff and I were on one side of the table, you know, the finance director, head of IT, uh, uh, the labor commissioner. We were around one side of that table and around the other side was whatever department was presenting that day, uh, transportation, sanitation, and we created a cadence of accountability around standards of openness and transparency and sharing our data. We told everybody, you can keep your individual silos if you like, as long as you can land the dots on the map so we can have an intelligent conversation every two weeks about what we're doing, whether we're doing it any better when we, than we were two weeks ago. And so we can ask the honest questions about how we might coordinate, communicate, and collaborate in ways that allow us to accomplish our mission. Um, so we took that enterprise-wide, and then when I was elected governor, we also used it at the state level as well. So I was, I was psyched to be able to talk to all of the men and women who were on, on this call who are doing exciting things, especially where transportation is concerned. Because while policing was, believe it or not, hard to remember this, but in the early 90s, it was policing that was at the forefront of this new age of openness and transparency. Um, today, though, it seems in my view, and I've worked with Grant Thornton, and you're going to hear from Tim uh, Luzano in a second. Uh, I've worked with Grant Thornton in states and local governments and counties all across the United States. And from what I see, it would appear that transportation has really become kind of the leading edge of this new way of governing. If the old way was oftentimes bureaucratic, closed silos of information, top down, uh, things get done according to the rule of because I said so, this new way of governing is about showing one another where our opportunities or problems are and figuring out together how we can uh, how can we can advance the mission? Uh, and uh, to state it another way, in the old days before everybody had access to information, uh, leaders used to position themselves at the top of that pyramid of command and control. But in this new way of governing, the most effective uh, place of position for the leader is not up here. It's instead in the center of that latest collaborative circle. It's drawing people back to uh, the map 
because let's be honest, you know, if we're working in a city, county, state, everything we do should have an impact in that city, county, or state. We take for granted as Americans that every place has an address, right? Or a parcel. Uh, but that is a, that common platform of the map has become in uh, the hands of courageous men and women leading their organizations has really become that new table of democracy, that common platform. Uh, uh, let me tell you one true story, and I'm not going to put on slide, Tim, so don't worry. Tim always worries about a guy over 55 doing screen share. Uh, I'm not even going to share the screen. Um, you all remember back in uh, Minneapolis, I think it was in 2000, oh, I forget the exact year, the Minneapolis bridge collapse on I-35 West, moms and dads on their daily commute plunging to their deaths when a bridge finally rattled so badly under the pressure of, of traffic, uh, structurally deficient bridge that everybody knew was structurally deficient. It collapsed, moms and dads plunged to their death and we were all horrified. Uh, shortly after that tragic event, the National Governor Association had a meeting. And there at the meeting was Jack Dangerman from one of Grant Thornton's strategic partners, ESRI, E-S-R-I, you know, the GIS people. In fact, they published my book, Plug. Um, and Jack said, look, he can't come up to me with his laptop, very excited. And he says, I know Governor Rendell from Pennsylvania is your leading advocate for greater investments in infrastructure. I have this new bridge app and you have to get me a, a meeting with him. I said, Jack, you have to understand something about Governor Rendell. He was like a big brother and a mentor to me as a mayor and as a governor. And while most of us as mayors managed to shorten our attention span to just two minutes, Rendell is down to 45 seconds and he's never lost that talent, even as a governor. And uh, Jack said, I'll, I'll take whatever time you can give me. So I drag a graph sing Governor Rendell into a corner with Jack Dangerman. Rendell's like, what is this about? Who is this guy? What's this about? I said, just trust me, you'll like this. So Jack opens up his laptop and, um, and I say to him, you have 45 seconds, go quickly. So the first click, he shows Governor Rendell a map of Minnesota. And it's, has all, it has green dots all over the map. And Dangerman says to him, this, each green dot represents one of the bridges in the state of Minnesota. Second click, he said, now with open data, I have color coded these dots, green, yellow, orange, red, uh, to show the structural integrity. Strong bridges are green, Weak bridges are red, varying degrees in between. We all get what the international language of stoplights, right? And so with the cl second click, the map is different dots with green, yellow, orange, red. He says, now with this third click, I want to show you, again with open data, available to everyone, how many human beings, how many souls travel over each of these bridges every day so the size of the maps, the size of the dots will expand depending on how many human beings depend on the bridge every day. So with that, he hit the third click and you could see large, larger red dots appear almost like targets on this map. And he said, now with the fourth click, again with open data, I want to show you with these little dollar signs, icons, where the dollars land on that map for the repair of bridges. And with the fourth click, all these dollar signs showed up. And Rendell looks at the screen and he says, none of the dollars are landing on the targets. To which Jack Dangerman says to him, no, but they're all landing on the map. The point of the story is, in whatever role we have in this longitudinal experiment of self-governance called democracy, we all have the opportunity to uh, do a better job of landing our effort on the targets. And here's the one insight I wanna leave you with. We take it for granted 
My adult kids think I'm nuts when I look at GIS or the little Uber car coming around on the app as if it's magic. They act like it's been here forever. But the truth is no generation of Americans, no generation of self-governing people have had better technology. The internet, information technology, and GIS to give them the ability to model, measure, and map dynamic changing systems, whether that system is a highway system, whether it's the waters of the largest estuary in North America, the Chesapeake Bay, whether it's where crime is happening in a, a city or a state, no people have had better technology to model, measure, and map those systems. And also to model, measure, and map the actions and the dollars we invest and we intend to change for the better those systems in order to better serve people. So with that as a tee up, uh, the next guy you're going to hear from is Tim Luzano at Grant Thornton, unless someone else is going to introduce him. Am I okay with this, Cecilia? Okay. So I've worked with Tim as he's developed in this time uh, post George Floyd of heightened awareness about just how much further we still have to go to overcome the legacy of racial injustice, of slavery, of all of the violence attendant with that, whether it's the violence of economic systems or the violence of, uh, of other systems. And so Tim has um, put together, done some pretty cool work, uh, largely with open data, but with some predictive analytics and the other cool stuff that Grant Thornton can do to apply that equity lens to transportation solutions, to mobility solutions, uh, to the allocation of grant dollars, so that uh, we don't have to trust some person on high. We can see for ourselves whether in fact our efforts are landing on the right targets of opportunity that make us a country uh, not only uh, of, by, and for the people, but one where there's actually liberty and justice for all. So with that, let me turn it over to Tim to talk about this equity lens and transportation modeling, measuring, and mapping. Tim? Awesome. Thank you, Governor. Always a tough act to follow. So <laughs> thanks for that. Thank I you. will start sharing my screen. Uh, see, he can do that. <laughs> All right, and let's see, share number two. Am I sharing? Can you all see the- Perfect. The yes, fabulous. Awesome, all righty. Thank you again, Governor. And for today's presentation, I really wanted to focus on applying an equity lens on key performance metrics, developing dynamic dashboards to measure KPIs, leverage GIS capabilities to identify underserved communities, identify specific actions that, that can be taken to improve racial equity and taking an agile approach to implementing these solutions. So let's take a look at what we've built. As I open up the portal, the first thing you see here is a landing page regarding a strategic plan for Metropolis DOT. And we are currently engaging with a potential new client regarding this equity solution. And they have told us they prefer not to share their name or logo, but I think you all are pretty smart to quickly figure out where Metropolis is. So Metropolis DOT has six different pillars of focus, one of which is equity. And so one of Grant Thornton's differentiators is that we take an agile approach to their strategic plan. First, we will tackle the equity pillar, which I am focusing on today. And then we will create the content for the other pillars in different sprints. For example, after we complete equity, we will move to health and safety and add those items to its backlog, finish that sprint, and then move on to the next pillar. But for today's demo, I strictly want to focus on equity. So I'm going to click on this equity card. Make this scroll down just a little bit. At the top, you can see I've called out three performance metrics pertaining to equity. And for today's demo, I want to focus on goal number two to apply MDOT's equity framework to how MDOT pursues and allocates resources. And for goal number two, the measurement for success is increasing investments in underserved communities. And so here's our first dashboard that we built. And the vision is to identify if we are investing in projects in underserved communities, which ties directly back to the objective of goal number two. Just a quick item of note before we dive into the dashboard, all of this data for this demo is publicly available data or is from Esri's data enrichment databases for demographics. 
So walking through the dashboard, the map on the left shows the city of Metropolis broken down into council districts. I would like to emphasize we can slice and dice the boundaries into any view a prospective client would like, such as a county view, a zip code view, or even a census tract view. And we have provided a couple of different viewpoints throughout this demo to showcase that ability. Next, we did a cross-reference analysis showing council districts with a high diversity index score, along with households below the poverty level. So quickly, the diversity index represents the likelihood that two persons chosen at random from the same area belong to different race or ethnic groups. So I'm gonna pull up the legend and walk you through that. So if you take a look at the diamond, as we traverse up the right side from this light shade of yellow to this darker shade of blue, we'll have a higher concentration of households below the poverty level. If we go up the left side of the diamond from the light shade of yellow to this darker shade of yellowish green, that's where we have a high diversity index. But what we're really concerned with is this area of dark green where we have a high diversity index and a high concentration of households below the poverty level. So I hope that makes sense. But let's focus on one of these council districts. And today I'm going to focus on council district number 10. So notice how our map dynamically zoomed, highlighted, and selected council district 10 data. As you can see, we have 89 projects in council district 10, which are identified by the red lines on the map. And then the district has a high diversity index score of 92.2 and impacts 20,000 households below the poverty level. So bringing it back more strategically, the objective of this dashboard is to provide transparency for the general public to see if MDOT is investing in projects in underserved communities. Scrolling down the page a little bit more, this next area allows us to drill down even further into analyzing equity by specific communities. Here we have sliced the data by BIPOC or Black Indigenous People of Color. Personally, I think this is the part of our analysis that really resonates with people as they wanna know, how are you impacting me? So if this site were public facing, I as a Pacific Islander, I could click on this Asian population card and see what specific projects are impacting me in my neighborhood. But for today's demo, we are going to focus on the African American community. So I will click on this black population card and let my page load up. All right. And so while this is loading, the dashboard follows the same approach of analyzing projects by council district. However, this view focuses specifically on the African American community. Once again, we cross reference African American households with the households below the poverty line. As you can see, the same core pleth map applies as the dark shade of green has a high African American household population and a high concentration of households below the poverty level. So let's focus on Council District 8 this time. So I will select Council District 8. And then as you can see, there are, oh, oh, there we go. There are 188 projects directly impacting 40,000 African American households and an African American population of 99,000. So scrolling down again, we wanted to analyze the data even more and cross-reference equity with other strategic initiatives that impact underserved communities in a meaningful way, such as education, health and safety, economic development, and COVID-19. We at Grant Thornton understand the importance of education, and it's especially near and dear to my heart as I am very passionate about education. So we cross-cut equity with education for our next analysis. So I'll click on this education card and let this page load up. So MDOT has an awesome initiative, path, initiative called Dash Pass. And so Dash Pass lets students ride Dash buses to and from school for free. And so the objective of this dashboard is to identify areas in underserved communities to add additional bus stops or routes to provide an equitable transportation source for kids to go to school. And so for this view, we examined Metropolis by council district and layered on a cross-reference of our African-American households living in areas below the poverty level. Some other KPIs we've included are the count of dash routes, dash stops, the African-American households, as well as a percent of African-American males and females aged 15 to 19, since I'm focused on high school kids for today's demo. And I do want to know MDOT is striving explicitly to provide equitable means for women, girls, and gender minorities. So let's take a look at a dark green area again. I'm gonna focus again on our friends over at council district number 10. So I will select council district 10. As you can see, the dashboard updated, and we have eight dash routes and 195 dash stops impacting 31,000 African-American households. And additionally, from our gender viewpoint, there are 51% females and 49% males that are being impacted. 
but let's try to actively identify where we can start to add dash routes to provide equitable access to transportation. So I'm going to turn on some layers where I wanna see where all my dash stops are, my dash routes, and then where are all my public high schools. Let that come up, let that load. I'm gonna zoom in just a little bit so you can see. All right, so making some assumptions about the current infrastructure, now the map clearly identifies an equitable transportation desert in the upper Northwest area of this council district, an area where MDOT can improve equitable transportation resources for African-American high school kids by adding a dash route or stop. So for example, we can clearly tell them if you just add a dash route along this area, now these kids will not have to walk if we make some assumptions more than a mile just to have access to this high school. Scrolling down a little bit, let me zoom in on my map just to get it teed up. All right, so this next example follows the same approach but from a different viewpoint. And for this analysis, we focused on the city metropolis but by neighborhood service area this time. And then we cross-referenced it by high black population and houses below the poverty level again. Next, we plotted all the dash bus stops and added a roughly half a mile walking distance zone from the bus stop, which you can see by the blue area around the pink dots. The idea here is it allows us to analyze areas where we can add more bus stops so individuals don't have to walk so far just to catch a bus to go to school. And additionally, for a future project in a different sprint, we could take this view one step further and analyze walking patterns given we had access to the data through high crime neighborhoods and determine if kids have to either A, risk their life by walking through a high crime neighborhood or B, see if they're walking long distances just to avoid those areas to catch a bus to go to school. So I'm gonna to toggle back to my home screen. Oops, it didn't refresh, so let me just hit refresh really fast so I can see my home button. There we go. All right. The next part of this demo covers a little bit of our agile approach as I wanted to cover other pillars in MDOT's strategic plan, but cross cut it to equity. As you can see, I've added some viewpoints regarding some initiatives on how health and safety, economic development and sustainability impact equity. So let's take a look at health and safety this time. So I'll click that card. And for today's demo, we wanted to focus on goal number three, increase the share of people walking and biking to support healthy communities. So I'll click on the circle right here. Now I'll scroll down and let my dashboard load. All right, while well, that's loading, for this dashboard, we took the city of Metropolis and are analyzing it at the census tract level. Let me zoom in on the map just a little bit. All right, so we're analyzing at the census tract level this time. Then we are applying a layer by race. And so the darker the shade of purple, the greater the diversity by race. Next, we've added a layer of bike paths in Metropolis designated by the dark blue lines. And then lastly, we've added a half a mile buffer to see how many households are within a half a mile buffer zone from this to have access to the bicycle infrastructure by the light shade of blue. Examining this data helps us answer questions about bike infrastructure access by population. As you can see to the KPIs on the right, we have the percent of population. We have the count of bike lanes. We have a total population. And then lastly, and most importantly, we have a chart on the bottom right showing the percent of population by race and so if I'm just going to play around in the map, I'll zoom in around the area of Council District 10 that I talked about earlier. Now we can quick, clearly see that the African-American population have about 32% access to the bike lanes in this portion, portion of Metropolis. So the idea for this dashboard is to address questions such as how many citizens are within a half a mile, mile to bicycle infrastructure? We can examine areas where there is not coverage and can identify potential areas to add bike infrastructure to enable safer and healthier travel options. We can also address questions such as, is our city providing equitable access to each community in the city? And then the dashboard also provides insight on different populations access to bike infrastructure compared to their percent of the total population. And then for my last analysis, we wanted to analyze another pillar or sprint, sustainability. So I'll click on this guy right here. And then once again, we have listed all the goals related to sustainability. And we wanted to focus on goal number three to increase equitable, affordable mobility options, especially where our choices are limited. We scroll down and zoom in on the dashboard so you can see. All right. And so. As you can see on the map in the dashboard, we've plotted designated DOCLA zones in the city of Metropolis. We have defined mobility equity zones in green. We have the pink zones are our transportation disadvantaged. 
And as you can see from the map with the larger the orange circles and to the bar chart on the left, the majority of the trips are not coming from our underserved communities. We have a big circle over in downtown LA and Santa Monica Pier, which makes sense, but not so much on the north side where our underserved communities are. So this allows us to visually see where MDOT can add more dock list stations to better serve underserved communities. And once again, this is a perfect area where if we had access to trip data, such as where the trips are started and ended, we could analyze trip routes to further understand travel patterns, such as are people in underserved communities using the scooters to get to a train station because it's over a mile away just so they can get to work? Well, that's all I have for today's demo. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I hope it was engaging and informative. So I will open the floor for questions or comments. Thank you so much. Thank well, you, that was, Jim. That was great, wasn't it, Jim? Ah, really, uh, really good, really good. Yeah. Thank you. I, I always love the uh, the cool technology can kind of get your juices flowing, and uh, but I think the big thing that you're showing is that it takes these important ideas and technology and shows us how that that can lead to a different reality for the people involved. Uh, you know, maybe that's it. Does anybody have a good story to show, to, to think about the reality of the, uh, the people involved in, in, uh, in these kinds of efforts and how it changes things for them? I, I think even just as Tim was sharing making a determination. First of all, I want to tell you, Governor O'Malley, that you know, when you talk about the fact that we are endowed with the greatest amount of technology and the greatest ability to make a difference using that technology, it is a shame oftentimes that we don't use it. And as you say, it creates that opportunity to understand what is available. So Tim, when you we're talking about the mapping of M, M dot and the transportation system, the bus lines and the like. We talked about in our meeting, we talked about the whole issue of paths for how far do kids have to walk to get to a bus to get them to school? And is there transportation available to them? And what does a mile long walk do if you have to walk a mile to get to the bus to get to school or to get to work, what does that do to productivity? And you can start looking at those kind of qualitative issues that are impacting your assets. And, and so that's an immediate impact that you can have utilizing technology. And I just really loved your comment, Governor O'Malley, about landing your effort on the target. Yeah. By yeah, having the only, technology, you learn what the target is. Yeah, if we only knew what we knew, right? If we if we only if we only all knew and understood what what we already know, um, I, I guess the <clears throat> the the downside of having so much technology and so much information is that you're totally awash in it. Uh, we can become a trivial culture and become overrun and the amount of data we have, suffer fatigue, uh, convince ourselves that people just make up stuff. But for people that are running large operations, transportation departments, cities, county, states, uh, the, it's, it's so essential to, to make it understandable. You know, the dashboards, the maps, and there's something about the map that it almost has its own, it's a, bit of a, it's, it's a bit of a passing of the truth test. I can recall as mayor going out and having, you know, we do mayor's nights out and we'd have the big screens and we'd show people that, uh, you know, the, how we meet the service demands, whether it was for graffiti or trash or what have you. And whenever I would start clicking through and showing people the new tools, some, someone would always raise their hand and say, can you show me my house? <laughs> there, there, there's something about the story of our own place that makes it kind of, uh, it is a reference point. It is, don't give me your speeches. Don't tell me 
uh, you know, what you want me to believe, I can see it. And if I can see it and you can see it, then why aren't we all doing something more about it? And what I found operationally was that when you start to bring people back to the data, the evidence, the map, um, not only of what is, but the actions we're taking to change it into something better, it is amazing with that sort of compelling visible scoreboard how your leaders rise. And if you can recognize the leaders uh, in the eyes of their peers, you get that whole organization to start tilting towards progress instead of rocking back to the traditional, and let's face it, for a long time, the traditional wisdom was leaders don't share information. You know, we'll give you the information if you file a FOIA. Uh, to, but if you, sh if you shift that sale, to the new customer expectations that not only do we share information and I'm not talking about indecipherable, you know, PDFs of, uh, of numbers. I'm talking about invisible mapped ways that can make sense to people. Eleanor Roosevelt had a beautiful term uh, when she was talking about the UN Declaration of Human Rights. She asked, what will this mean in the small places close to home? So when you're able to show people uh, the, the how and why, it is amazing how uh, it is amazing how an entire organization starts to to take actions that follow those leaders, follow the leading examples, and also understand how their job makes sense in it. I mean, uh, we can become so specialized in our work that sometimes we forget that we're part of a really big team doing really important stuff. Well, guess what? GIS and the data, not intimidated by big. <laughs> it can go big. It can go big. As human beings, we sometimes are. <laughs> but but uh, the map and showing people on the on that common platform, uh, I think is a huge game changer. And, and that uh, we just need to apply the leadership and management practices to, to what the technology already makes possible. And I would also say, Governor O'Malley, that it would also be the partnership practices because as you are changing the people internally to lean and have the different culture and to focus on customer service and focus on providing equity in terms of offering, you are also, when you share and follow your openness and transparency model, you Correct. are impacting your constituency and you are making a difference for that constituency because as you say nobody cares about the big picture the the report you have they care about what are you doing for me what what's in it for me the with them right and we've all been dealing with this we've all been dealing with this covid thing how many of us would go online and look at that johns hopkins covid tracker map every day at the outset of this, where you could see anywhere in the world, whether it was spiking up, whether it was going down, whether the death cases were going up, whether hospitals were becoming overwhelmed. I've, I mentor a number of new mayors uh, every semester, I guess, every year with Mike Bloomberg's GovX uh, oh. lab. And what some of the sharper mayors are doing on these vaccinations is actually showing people the penetration of vaccinations down to that neighborhood level. Uh, because when it comes to, you talk about partnerships, hey, there's nothing big that requires a bigger partnership than public health in a pandemic. We're all in it together. We need everybody to take the actions either to protect themselves with the mask before, always, or, or now to get vaccinated. But being able to show people and let people know, uh, not to embarrass anyone, but just to say, hey, look, in this section of Middle, Middle East, uh, a neighborhood in Baltimore, we have a huge opportunity to get vaccines to people that don't yet have it. Uh, what can we do? Uh, how can we get inside the turning radius? I can see it on a map. You can see it on the map. So what are we doing about where the targets are? How do we deploy effort to the targets? Absolutely. And so the other question I would like to ask that I'm seeing a few questions and comments. As we talked about and I and you know I know I gave a glossing overview of the paper that we did the white paper that we did on equity and and utilizing it to utilizing asset management to advance equity 
but the general concept of involving relevant stakeholders, I'd like to know what your thoughts are about the possibility of using a standard like ISO 55000 within government, within the public and private sector to start addressing who is at the table and who needs to be at the table? Where are the unusual suspects? Hmm. Tim, you want to? I don't. I don't want to monopolize Tom. I mean, I have, I have some thoughts. I can, I can riff for a little bit, but um, you're uh, the main event. People here are here to hear you speak, so feel free. Oh, but we want a diversity of voices too, Tim. So you <laughs> pipe in at any point, as will Jim, hopefully. Yeah, I'll try to be. I'll, I'll try to be as brief as I can be. The, the, the one standard that's out there right now that everybody has is the standard of addresses. There are addresses. There are parcel locations. Uh, uh, that's been a, a huge game changer. In the municipal context, there were standards brought about for how uh, the finances of any municipality was reported, and this allowed. Uh, then, uh, full disclosure, I advise a company called ClearGov. And what they do is they take that data and they turn it into understandable infographics. Uh, yeah, well, so what? Mm -hmm. So then you can see how your town stacks up to another town of relatively the same size in terms of what they spend money on, how much they spend on snow removal compared to your town, how much they spend on education compared to your town. That ability to compare like to like across different borders in different places uh, is, is, is also part of the, you know, teachers call it pedagogy, learning from one another how to teach. Uh, we need to learn from one another how to better provide transportation solutions. And you saw a lot of this happening recently with the, uh, uh, the data sharing standards uh, that were kind of brought about by micromobility, the, the scooter companies that wanted to do business in all sorts of cities and the city said, wait a minute, we need a way to track and see that you're not just putting the bikes in rich people's neighborhoods or the scooters, but you're actually serving all people. Uh, that too is bringing forward new standards. Uh, uh, I think the standards are key, uh, but, but I think we should not overlook uh, the, the standards that we already have. It's, uh, 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 you all know far more about uh, uh, about the particular uh, standards in the white paper uh, than I do, but but Tim, those are a couple thoughts off the off the top of my my head. Uh, standards are key. They allow us to they allow us to speak a common language, you know, and to share across all sorts of distances and spaces. So if if I could jump in, it's it's a really exciting discussion. And if I put uh, uh, my asset management hat, you know, on with my equity hat, uh, uh, there's an exciting concept involved, which is we've been very much uh, interested in promoting this approach to asset management. And obviously, equity is a big part of it. And perhaps is uh, you've given us one answer to the question of what we'll get. Uh, politicians and government leaders uh, to pay attention to the possibilities offered by this approach to asset management involving, uh, you've given us the example of involving uh, visualization of data and how that can make equity uh, differences. Uh, might I ask you uh, if you have any other insights that you could share, an insight you could share on those of us that are trying to advance this approach, how we might approach uh, figures in roles like the roles you've had? What do you, how you might approach the, the leader of the organization? Yes, to get them, uh, you know, to get there, we think we have a solution uh, and mm -hmm. we need to find a way to get that, uh, the attention of those people. The 45 second example is brilliant, but uh, I'm pushing my luck and asking for another one. <laughs> yeah, I think you have to show positive change over time. Okay. Positive change over time on a map. Uh, uh, my, 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 the, the, the two people that served as my scheduler, toughest job in state government. Uh, <laughs> well, 
knew that when people were coming in to talk to me, they would kind of warn them. They said, make sure you bring a map, you know, and they would say, what do you mean? They said, make sure you're able to show him why what you're talking to him about is make where it makes a difference, why it makes a difference. So I, I would show change over time on a map. There is nothing. And all of these elected leaders uh, make no mistake about it. They're very good at reading maps. They have become steeped in maps, would roll up their sleeves in the data that said who's going to vote where and what the polling was telling them. So they're accustomed to maps. And too often, once they get elected, it's like, you know, 10 page white papers and impenetrable tables. Uh, use the map, show change over time on a map, uh, and even model the change. I mean, uh, for years, we had. Uh, every time uh, we would talk about the Chesapeake Bay, everybody in Maryland would say, oh, yeah, we got to save the bay. It stretches over six different states and usually men in gray suits, the governors in the past, they've mostly been men, uh, would get together and express a 40 year hope for cleaning up the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, but we started we started mapping the not 34,000 actions, the 34 actions that we needed to take. We, we, we showed on a map simple red light, green light, and this time the health of the water rather than the health of the bridges, you know, what actions we needed to take in that water part of the watershed uh, in order to make a difference on agriculture. How many, if you do 80,000 more acres of cover crop a year, what's the value in nitrogen reduction? Show me what that means in terms of water quality over time, if we can keep adding another 80,000 over the year. So showing change over time on a map, I think is, is, uh, is, is a way to get the attention of politicians. They speak in maps, they see maps, they're scheduled every day, they're going places on maps. That's really good. Tim, can, can I get your feedback on that? And then we have a, 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 a special guest to ask a question. Yeah, just to echo the governor's sentiments, it's showing progress. And then it's really that concept of transparency, right? Especially we have all this CARES Act funding and the American Re Recovery Planning, those dollars are coming. And so you might hear an agency say, oh, well, we, we have dedicated $500 million towards our equity initiatives. It's like, okay, that sounds like a lot to the common person, right? But it's like, where did you invest it? And what did you do? Did it actually make an impact? So it's that progress over time and the showing the transparency of where on the map and what did you do exactly? Uh, earlier, uh, Cecilia mentioned uh, Hugh Sinclair of the Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission. And he had a, a really good question. Uh, so I asked uh, if we could promote him to a panelist so we could uh, ask it in person. So. Uh, you, uh, I think you maybe get the last question. Uh, you know, welcome and thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks, Jim. I really appreciate it. Uh, so I really enjoyed the conversation. I think this is certainly a passion of mine, uh, and I would certainly like to ask the governor a question. Uh, as we start to realize the structural impediments to actually making equitable changes in our communities, uh, what thought process must be given to making a, a change in terms of the philosophy around equitable design? Uh, in our infrastructure improvement, especially knowing that uh, we may have similar communities with similar projects, but the scope ends up being vastly different based on the power of advocacy that's created in that community and their knowledge base that they bring to it. How do we create that change so that we can actually have uh, something that's a proactive change versus a reactive change in reporting? Ah, uh, the, the squeaky wheel syndrome, right? I mean, the people that the people that have the, the wherewithal to advocate and to spend time advocating uh, tend to get tend to get more in terms of government services, and that's probably also and that's certainly true in transportation as well. There is an emerging new story uh, that I think is eclipsing the old story of growth for the sake of of growth wherever the growth might happen, and that new story is the health and well-being of the whole. So. The, to the extent that as the thinking and caring people, we can show one another uh, uh, in, in, in clear and understandable ways uh, uh, using these technologies and using the map, the well-being of the whole. The goal must always be the well-being of the whole. Uh, uh, 
And when I was mayor of Baltimore, we were, we received 200 additional police officers. Eric Holder came, uh, Kwaisi and Fume was there. Applause, applause. Baltimore's getting 200 more police officers to put on the streets. We had a decision to make where to send them. Well, in the old ways, we would have divided them equally, maybe between the six council districts, or more likely, we would have divided half of them equally, and then when we'd sent the other ones to the wealthiest, loudest areas <laughs> that have the, that call their council people. Instead, we looked at the well-being of the whole. We showed everyone the map of where our citizens were being shot and robbed and mugged in tiny little pockets on either side of town. And we said, this is where we're sending the officers. It was about the well-being of the whole. And as the wealthier people pushed back, we said, yeah, but what about the well-being of the whole? You know, it's it's that common good. Uh, and and I, I think... Uh, we have to be on guard against uh, in this era where we kind of worship the crowdsourced and what we're hearing by people on the internet or on Twitter or even calling 311. Uh, there's a lot of poor families who don't have time either or don't have broadband access or or are just have so many other more pressing problems that you're not going to hear from them on the 311. So you learn to send inspectors there. You learn to be more engaged with the community leaders that are there. You give greater uh, access from, from uh, of the leader to the leaders in those places. You know, you adjust for it. Uh, it's like the layers that Tim was showing. Uh, we're a rich, diverse, multi-layered society. Uh, that doesn't give us, that shouldn't give us license to be, you know, blinded by how dazzling it is or the ability to close our eyes. We just need to open our eyes to be awake, to recognize the tapestry and the layers and to, to continue to bring people back to the well-being of the whole. Uh, uh, and um, uh, I, I guess it is a philosophy change in a, in a way, Hugh, uh, because while it might require additional work in our politics, it also, it also creates better outcomes in terms of the society we design for our kids. If I could just ask a follow-up question in terms of a structural change that we could make. Uh, since the power of the purse has such leverage in terms of the development of our communities, could we, in, could we envision a return on investment that's focused on the equity and the equitable change in our communities that could then control our capital expenditures and ensure that a structural change has great leverage rather than through the power of additional advocacy to highlight deficiencies? Yes, I think that, I think that moment's here. Elections have consequences. And the new president of the United States has said that with the dollars being distributed to cities and counties and states, they want, they want them to be distributed mindful of equity and sustainability. What will, it, what will these dollars do to create a more just society and what will these dollars do to create a more sustainable, which is also more just in generational terms, a more sustainable way of living? I think that moment's here, man. Uh, uh, and we and we and, and and now it remains to be seen whether mayors and county executives and governors are up to all of the discretion they've been given. Uh, but but that's certainly the that's certainly the song being sung from the center. And uh, let's hope we all can uh, pick up on the chorus. Uh, Cecilia, any final thoughts? Well, I, I, I have to say, I love the fact that you said the, the guarding against the crowdsourcing for ideas and really going out and seeking those unusual voices, the players that don't have access, that aren't being interviewed. So that is really key and critical. I, I have to say that I agree with you that the time is now, and I do believe that the concept that we put out in the paper in terms of looking at a call to action that once people understand the application of the ISO 55,000 structure and apply it, they will be able to increase the value from their assets and reduce their overall risk because there's a risk in not including everybody and not providing equity. Equity, the failure to provide equity, uh, provide equitable services, equitable resources and distribution carries a large risk. The, the failure to 
not be transparent carries a large risk. But understanding what the relationship is between whatever asset and whatever organization, whatever community you sit in, the stakeholders that are involved, the relationships are the key. Whether right, it's the right. internal relationships of the employees, staff, government, it doesn't matter. It's the relationships that are the key and that is the key asset that we have to deal with. Coming together to understand each other's stories and using the stories to fuel our ability to do whatever the task is at hand. So I, I think that using technology to show the story of the overall so that you can be transparent. Because I always say in economic development, you always show the shiny, beautiful new buildings, but you don't show the broken glass. But don't think that the people in the car as you're driving them around don't see the broken glass communities and wonder what you're doing. It's key to have a strategic asset management plan for every community, every organization to address those broken glass windows and to address their relationships. So I yeah. think that this is something that I'd love to see us continue to partner. Th Th um, Grant Thornton is taking a lead in many ways and doing this kind of technical work and working with Esri. I had worked a little bit with MasterCard when they were doing their retail location insights. And it's the same concept, Governor O'Malley, mapping the information so that people have a clear understanding of potential, of where dollars are flowing, where growth ought to be going, and making smart decisions, like you say, smarter government, and remembering that government is we the people, of the people, for the people, and by the people. So to that, I really want to thank you. I want to thank Jim for the opportunity to be in this. And Tim, I, I, the hard work that you do. Hugh, you always come up with great ideas because the ROI for equity ought to be something that we can figure out because what gets measured gets done. So right. thanks. And I'll leave, I'll leave you the last word, Jim. Well, uh, I did want to say if you, if you don't follow Hugh on LinkedIn, you're missing lots of good information. <laughs> he has some great posts. But uh, I, I did want to get around to Tim, uh, if we have another couple of minutes, and uh, see if Tim had any closing thoughts or uh, that he'd like to share with us today. No, no, nothing major, but thank you for having me. I'm extremely honored to be one of your guest speakers and shedding light to equity and advancing equity initiatives in the federal, state, and local government and asset leader asset leadership network thank you so much and we want to thank uh, besides thanking the panelists and uh, thanking you for joining us we want to thank uh, nick kanoki and mike bordinaro of aln for putting this on and putting it together and Moshe ellison of grant thornton who's uh, our, our primary contact with grant thornton it's been an amazing uh, experience and i think uh, governor and, and panelists you've given us uh, topics that will keep us busy for a year or more uh, and some real insights on how to go forward. So uh, Governor, I'll leave you the last word. Uh, any any last words you'd like to share with us today? I'll just say thank you and underscore what uh, Ms. Mo what Ms. Moat said about relationship. If it's not about relationship, it's not about anything. Oh, we need to figure out a way in our democracy to trust one another. And that there's no trust without a, without a, without the integrity of relationship. It's all about relationship. Thank you for having me, appreciate it. Well, thank you to everybody. I'm sorry there were questions that we did not get to. Uh, I tried, but it's hard. <laughs> so we, we got to some of them, uh, but we will save them and uh, see if we can uh, share or process them in some way. So again, thank you all so much. And uh, again, especially Governor O'Malley, uh, an honor or privilege to have you join us today. My, My pleasure, thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Be well.